He called people from China. He called people from all over the world, saying that make me live longer. And all of them were petrified because they knew that if they told the great Chinggis Khan that it is not possible, they would lose their head. So they gave him some stories, and he died. Anyway, so um, the trait theories, and then we'll talk about the behavioral theories, and then what kind of behavior, and then we'll do a small test. What kind of behavior sort of um, predisposes leadership? And we'll talk about um, the contingency theories of leadership and describe the contemporary theories of leadership, one of which is what is called as servant leadership. Have you heard of this term, servant leadership? Yeah, where servant leadership is where you are truly, uh, you serve the people that you lead. You don't behave like a boss or a leader or something like that. You are uh, a good example are people like, say, Gandhi or Martin Luther, Luther King and so on and so forth. Who? Martin Luther King Jr. That is the, not the evangelist, but the uh, guy who fought for the civil rights movement in the United States. So, um, um, the, and then the contingency theories uh, of leadership and so on and so forth. Um, first, leaders, what is a leader's role in creating ethical organizations and so on and so forth, right? So um, leadership is the ability to influence a group towards achievement of a vision or set of. So when you don't have a vision or a set of goals, you're going to start questioning as to what is the role of the, why are you going to question? Yeah, but why are you going to question? Why should you question a leader? When you don't like his... No, no, I mentioned in the beginning of the class. You gave him authority and power over you. Remember that any leader has power and... Does Narendra Modi have power and leader over you? Uh, power and uh, influence over you? Authority? He does. Yeah? So do you have the right to question him? You do. Why? Because I've given you authority. So that's the equation. Please remember that always. And if there is a breakdown there, where it happens in many families, you have issues later on. In the, you have troublesome guys in your office. Peek into their childhood experiences. They definitely have a problem. So um, also not all leaders are managers, nor are managers leaders. What's the difference between a manager? Should a manager be a leader? Good. So if you look at companies like Google, even when they hire, Google is one of the toughest companies to get into. They have several rounds of interviews and then they're very clear. Even when they are interviewing, we say a 22 year old guy or a 21 year old guy, they're looking to see whether this person has leadership potential. Yeah? Potential to lead in the long term. So what is the difference between a leader and a manager? A manager would be managing a team uh, yeah. and would be taking care of goals and objective or the vision which has been uh, trickled down from the top management. Okay. So he would not be uh, he he would he would be doing whatever he is doing is in line with the vision. Mm. He will take initiative, but it would be within the spectrum of that vision. Uh, Very nice. To, mm. yeah. So who are you, uh, Berry Anshul? Anshul. Anshul. Unsure. 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 Right. So, uh, thank you. Fundamentally, leaders are those people who set a new vision. Uh, and because of that, they encourage certain amount of instability. Yeah, there is certain amount of chaos. Managers are those people who push towards stability. They want stability all the time so that you don't have mavericks running around and doing peculiar things. So there is a fundamental difference between leaders and so was Gandhi a manager? He was. He was also a leader simply because he set a strong vision and he sort of motivated and encouraged people. Why is say, is Mayavati a leader? She is because she sets a vision for her people. Her segment of people, 
whatever people she leads so there is a vision that she sets for them so she is a leader is modi a leader yes he is um so you can take several people is is that pawar fellow what's his name sharad pawar is he a leader yes he leads a certain section of people people follow him for whatever reason why because they set a vision and then they give hope to their followers managers are generally not setting visions if you if a manager needs to become a leader then he or she needs to set a long term vision for what they are doing and say that you know um what 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 do i see in the next 10 years or 15 years 20 years or whatever it is yeah so non sanctioned leadership is often as important or more important than formal what is non sanctioned leadership you don't have a position yeah so <clears throat> uh, very interestingly if you look at gandhi when independence came 1947 he was offered any position he could have become prime minister he could have become president of india he refused to take any formal position so his was a non sanctioned leadership so he sort of uh, led without a formal position any other examples that you might come across people like this non sanctioned leadership that is they don't have formal positions but they lead they wield enormous influence who are these people bhagat singh okay who else anna hazare is a good example all non sanctioned leaders people who sort of um um although of course there is a lot of criticism of mother teresa these days in contemporary literature coming from the west not from india yeah about what she did but again a good example of non sanctioned she did not have any great formal position but wielded enormous influence yeah so um very interesting so non sanctioned leadership is also very important and you have it in organizations yeah you can have so for example um uh, junior guy uh, he doesn't do much but he's close to the boss boss is his uncle so that is non sanctioned leadership and he starts wielding influence or power yeah so this can be both ways sir i mean it doesn't have to be one generally we talk about quality this was a very extreme example okay. i gave yeah but generally you will attain leadership because of some qualities that you might have which are not evident among other people yeah so say in a say say on a, on my ship several years ago if there was an underwater leak the obviously as captain i have no idea what i mean i know generally what to do i can't go there and weld so the welder who's going to do some underwater welding at that point in time is a non sanctioned leader everybody follows him if he tells you please go and get two welding rods you will go and get two welding rods after that is fixed he comes back to his position of being a welder but at that point of time he is a he is a leader yeah so you must understand that you must give people that space because people want to be leaders and if they are being non sanctioned leaders but they are doing some good work you should allow them to do that good work as a manager and so on and so forth yeah so trait theories of leadership is like i said that so generally they found that um people who what are leadership traits they say what should you have as a leader to be successful if you can talk about personality anyway i'm sure none of you would remember what i taught i mean what sanjay taught in personality but what are some personality traits anybody remembers personality hello no 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 not generic i want personality traits so he must have talked about the big five that is extroversion introversion he must have talked about conscientiousness must have talked about agreeableness open to experience and emotionally instable or neurotism so if you look at these five traits what do you think a leader should have more importantly very good extrovert yes and 
So in the Western world, they believe that if you have enough amount of extroversion, that is, you can reach out to people and connect and so on and so forth, then you're a good candidate for leadership. And along with that, you must have something called as conscientiousness. Conscientiousness is your levels of responsibility. Are you responsible enough that you care for what happens around you, to other people, to yourself? See, one of the problems, see, when Narayan Murthy says that 80% of young people are not employable in India, what does he mean, actually? What does he mean? He means that they are not capable of taking care of themselves. Leave alone taking care of anybody else. He says that 80%, his point of view, of people are not capable of, and if you look at it very carefully, when I look at placement, what are they trying to check actually? If you come into my organization, can you manage yourself first properly or not? Can you wear, can you, can you brush your teeth and come? Can you wear proper clothing? I mean, are you some nasty piece of goods that I'm letting into my place? Will you harass other people? And then can you do the job as we require? I mean, whatever little job they give. But people start talking about big things. Yeah. So conscientiousness is your, your responsibility towards not only yourself, but also the situation and other people. So the trait theory of leadership in the Western world, they believe that if you have a good amount of extroversion, that is you're able to reach out and connect with other people and you have, um, you're conscientious, then you're a good candidate for Absolutely no. You have several great leaders who are introverts, like Gandhi himself, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Zuckerberg. Now, all these guys are visionaries and great people who have no pretense of being. Are they conscientious? Yes. Yeah. I think conscientious is conscientiousness is a central trait, but extrovertism and introvertism are kind of good if you have it. If you don't have it, also good. You can sort of work with it as long as you can connect with other people and sort of get a job done. So a comprehensive review of the leadership literature when organized around the big five has found extroversion to be the most predictive trait of the effective. This has been debunked, yeah? But this was the start of leadership theory in the Western world, the trait theory of leadership. And unlike agreeableness and emotional stability, conscientiousness and openness to experience also showed strong relationship to openness to experiences, of course. How open are, are you to? Uh, how many of you are vegetarian? Suppose I put you in China and you have to eat two cockroaches, will you eat? Uh, so then, so according to them, that means she is not very open to experience. Yeah, I took again a very extreme example. So um, openness to experiences, are you willing to try new things on a regular? Are you willing to read new books? Are you willing to read new types of, uh, are you willing to listen to new types of music? Or, or you want to listen to the same Lata Mangeshkar types and uh, Kishore Kumar and their duets and so on and so forth? Or you are good for some jazz music or blues or something like that? Yeah. So, um, but I think it's a good, good thing to do. Open your mind to new because it stimulates your brain in many ways. Don't get stuck in the old. Yeah, so there's some people tell you, I eat every day two chapatis and one small katori of sabji and one curd. It's not a good way to lead life. Yeah, you must experience Several things. I'm not saying that you should go and sort of uh, do very extreme things, but explore life. Yeah. So um, uh, uh, extroversion, openness to experience, conscientiousness are some things that people ought to have according to the trait theory. So um, this is what they said. Are able to assert themselves, they're extroverted, are disciplined and able to make keep commitments they make that is conscientious. So later on, um, there's a, a guy called Daniel Goldman. 
There's another chap called Richard Boatsis. Boatsis teaches at the Case Western Reserve University. I know him quite well. So a couple of times he came here for lectures and so on. He wrote um, a series of articles with Daniel Goldman talking about emotional intelligence or empathy. How empathetic you are. So today they say that, you know, you must empathize with people. You must be kind. Eventually, you must be, again, coming back to what Confucius said and so on and so forth, you must be kind where kindness is needed. Yeah? You can't go through life saying that I will function like a robo and there are no emotions at play at all because emotions uh, affect our decision making like somebody has told you and so on and so forth. So, um, and also, what are, the, what are the emotional triggers of other people? What triggers them and what can you do? So as a manager or a leader, you must know that, um, um, you know, what is the emotional pulse of people? Any examples can you give me of where leaders use emotion? All politicians. Yeah. So Modi is talking about Atma Nirbharta make in India and so on. Gandhi did the same thing, saying that, you know, I will starve to death if you guys don't fall in line and so on and so on. So all leaders um, use uh, emotion. Same with, say, Nelson Mandela, a great guy, again, a very good servant leader, or Martin Luther King. All of them use, unless you have other genre of leaders like Stalin and Paul Pot who straight away shot you in the head. Huh? and said, end of the story, let's move on to the next guy. Are you falling in line or no? Yeah, But then that doesn't really seem to work nowadays. So people high in EI are more likely to emerge as leaders even after taking cognitive ability and personality into... That is why you have several people who are very intelligent, who have done academically very well, failing as... or failing as top quality managers. Why? Because they seem to have a lack of, yeah, they can't empathize, uh, they don't know what's happening, and so on and so forth, right? So traits can predict leadership, but it doesn't lead to really leaders being, just because they have traits does not mean that they will make good because other things can derail them. Actually, What can derail them? What can derail you from being a great leader? You have everything going for you. Your followers. This may not be interested in what you're talking about. Yeah? Ability to influence. Yeah, you said something. Ability to influence. Ability to influence, okay. okay. Maybe uh, he is not able to convey what he want to convey to his associates. He's not able to convey what he, communication is. So can you, communication, of course, is very important for any leader. And you can see why Modi is so successful, because he's able to communicate well, and our friend Rahul Gandhi is unable to communicate or say what he wants to say. So today morning's paper, I was a little amused. Uh, there's a full place, full page advertisement from, I don't generally talk politics in class, because I couldn't, can't resist since I saw him also, about uh, from the DMK saying, dawn of the Dravidian civilization or some cock and bull story. Huh? <laughs> While, uh, so again, they're playing to Emotions, yeah. Um, so, um, yeah. So while while we can have traits, we sort of can't be assured that leaders, because followers may not really follow you, and that's why you know leaders like to have people followers who don't think too much and don't question what. Um, so if I was a follower, if I was in Tamil Nadu and I had a nerve, I would have gone and asked them that there is no 
scientific proof that there is a different that there is an Aryan in global gravity. It has been disproved at every forum. But our politicians obviously don't believe in science. So they keep saying whatever they want to say and take the general public along. Whoever doesn't want to think. Nevertheless. Okay. So behavioral, and then they came on to something called as the behavioral theory of leadership. So the behavioral theory of leadership said that there are two kinds of leaders. Either you are task oriented or you are people oriented. That is, you have high levels of empathy, compassion, and so on and so forth. You care more about people and you care less about the, the work. Or there are some people who care more about the task and care less about the all of us fall in some bucket. The idea is to know which bucket you fall into so that you can sort of work on the uh, other area. So for example, I know that I'm a pretty task oriented leader. I want the job done. But then I also, you know, as I age, have become a little bit more compassionate and so on and so forth and say, okay, be a little nice to people and um, uh, unless they annoy me really and sort of um, allow them to their space and you know, be a little kind to people and so on and so forth. So you can, as a leader, you can reflect and balance some of these Things. The idea is to know. The idea is on self-reflection and introspection. So a lot of research was done in the University of Ohio and the University of uh, Michigan at the Ross School. And uh, they came up with some theories, which are called as the behavioral theories of... So this went on for some time. So after the um, trait theories, the behavioral theories took... Uh, and this was an output of that, the Blake and Mountain managerial, which is fascinating. So Blake and Mountain took behavioral theories and they put uh, the x-axis and y-axis, that is concern for production and concern for people. And then they came up with several leadership styles. So uh, one is, of course, one one. You neither care about people nor the go and warm the seat and uh, time pass and go home. You'll find a lot of government servants and all that. Yeah, I won't care what happens to you, uh, nor do I care about the I just kind of go there and it's called impoverished leadership. And then the, con the concern for people is very high, but the concern for production is very, so that is what is called the country club style. If you get a boss like that, please join. Yeah, because the concern for work is not there at all. Doesn't care, but the concern for people is very high. And is a wonderful place to work in. You On the other side, you have a nine by one. That is, a concern for the task is very high. Concern for people is very low. I don't care you know, about people and so on and so forth. I am more concerned with getting a job done. This is a place which sort of runs very well for a short while until people slowly start they start rebelling and then they say, you know, you don't care about me. In a recession, these kind of leaders are fantastic. Yeah, or also when the company is doing very badly. And then you want it, you know, hauled out of a crisis. People like Jack Welch. Have you heard of Jack Welch? Jack Welch is voted as the number one CEO of the century. He was a legendary CEO of General Electric. General Electric is this Thomas Alva Edison organization, more than 100 years old. It was doing badly in the 70s and the 80s. And the Americans were very concerned because this is one of their iconic organizations. So they brought in Jack Welch. Welch is a PhD in chemical engineering. It's called Neutron Jack. He used to fire people just like that. So first thing he came in, so he had got into, like the Tatas, right from aircraft engineering to making plastic buckets. They were in every business that they could, lending money and so on. So Jack Welch came and made an announcement and he said, tell me all businesses that we are in, industries that we are in, where we are neither number one or two. So they came with a list of, we are not number one or two in plastics. We are not one or two in this one. That Close them. Took 30 seconds. All were closed. What happened to the people? 
let go tomorrow you don't have a job thank you very much carry on get that Term four, actually. So, uh, um, so he was called neutron Jack, yeah. And uh, classically, you know, high task oriented. So, um, he was a very interesting guy. There are some interesting stories about Jack Welch. For example, one story is that he was a very important meeting. In the evening, um, at six o'clock, and he suddenly said, "I have to cancel. I can't do." So somebody asked him, "Why?" So he said, "My neighbor is teaching me how to use the internet." Neighbor was a eleven-year-old boy. This guy was the CEO of one of the largest companies in the world. So he was a little maverickish, but he turned GE and hauled it out of its issues and became one of the great. Another good guy is. to read about is uh, gersner louis gersner of ibm so in the 1980s again ibm was having serious problems and they brought this gersner the problem was gersner knew nothing about it but he became the ceo first thing he walked into ibm he looked around and said you know all these paintings are they copies or the originals so somebody said they are originals so he said sell them and they raised a few billion dollars and then he said this carpets feel very comfortable um sell all the carpets and he told these guys you will not stay in any five star hotel anymore you will stay in a three star till we start making classic you know task oriented index get the job done and then we will look at your comfort and well being so it works well particularly when organizations are in when organizations are in trouble you don't want to bring a people oriented leader he's going to make it worse yeah and then you have got of course the 9 by 9 this is a superman he's good at people he's also good at task he gets both superman or batman or whatever yeah they get both done you want to be in that space if you want to call yourself a great leader yeah Any questions? You know, I think I think Abdul Kalam was a good example, who was reasonably good at his job, but was fantastic with people. A good combination. So he may not have been the greatest engineer, but he led people extremely well. Um. You got. Elon Musk is more of a task oriented. Yeah, he doesn't really care. He said no about that Indian lady who got fired. She's uh, gobbles in a pant suit. So that Vijaya Gande got the sack uh, as soon as he bought Twitter. He um, she was the one who got Trump kicked out of Twitter. Which he didn't appreciate. So when he took over, he said, "Thank you very much. I don't see your point of view." So the very what? Not necessarily. I think it is more context based. So we look at the contingency style of. how do you bring in how do you tailor your leadership based on that's the most sensible thing to do how do you alternate between different styles so once you understand yourself well when do i play the people part when do i play the task part when do i play the servant part you know and place my team ahead of me and so when do i play on emotions when do i sort of um just give everybody a kick on the back side and get them to move on when do i fire two three people just to pass a message to everybody else so if, if you're able to alternate or move between different styles of leadership then you're going to be successful and i think that is what makes great leaders and i think you know one of the reasons why say our friend modi ji is successful 
So for example, he just gave up on the farm laws. So people say it's a defeat and all. He said, okay, let me retreat for the moment. It will come. Some other time it will come. Yeah. But for the moment, I will accept. There's no ego here. I will accept defeat and retreat for the moment. I will return. I live to fight another day. Yeah. But some areas is also compassionate, gas for the poor people, this, that, and the other, but a tough on GST, demonetization. So there are different kinds of faces that you see of a single person. Yeah? So uh, it's very interesting. Anyway, any other examples that you guys might have of people who adopt different leadership styles? Yeah, Tata is a, Tata is a good leader. He's a compassionate leader. He tries to sort of, um, just they, but they're using their enormous wealth to muscle other people out of business. It is, I think it's fair game in a capitalistic um, um, economy, but it's a little predatory. I got more money than you. So you opened a small store. So I want to destroy you. So I'll open a bigger store next to you. I don't care. I can absorb for five years making losses, but you can't. So I'll make sure you run away and leave the field open. So behind all their um, and of course, I'm being recorded, but behind all their wonderful CSR activities and so on and so forth, they use their financial muscle to uh, keep other people from maybe, maybe thriving or, 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 or doing business. So that is capitalism for them. So they will leverage, they will leverage, uh, they will, leverage, and people ought to. So, you know, a personal example, um, when my son was doing his engineering, uh, he, uh, first year, he told me that he's struggling to get textbooks. So he was a little puzzled, actually. So he went uh, to this place called IIT Roorkee, and he was doing his engineering. So Roorkee is far away in the north. So um, I asked him, what's the problem? So he said, there's a library. And the library has a certain amount of free books and uh, which the seniors have given. And I can't seem to access books in that library. So I asked him why, but why don't you buy books? I mean, we can afford it. He said, no, all the, my classmates generally borrow from. Yeah. So actually I had to teach him some truth. I said, you know, about maybe half your class in the IIT is of people on reservation. Did they leverage something getting in there? So he said, yes, they leverage their caste status. I said, you leverage your money that you have. Yeah. So then he went and bought all his textbooks and things returned to novel. So the thing is that I think everybody does that. And if you're sensible, you will do that. It's a practical way to live life. You will sort of leverage what is your if you're good at communication, please leverage it. No, no, other people are useless at English, so I will also not speak English. I will speak Kannada or Marathi or something. Is a foolish way to... What do you say? You agree with me or no? Whatever strength you have, you leverage your strength. That is... That's your potential. That is, that is how capitalism operates. Yeah? Um, so the so the Blake and Mountain leadership grid is very very um, interesting. It's an interesting grid. It talks about different styles of, and we'll try to figure out now. We'll try to figure out whether you are a task oriented or you are a people oriented leader. Yeah? So then there are various other studies. The Globe study is very interesting on leadership. Um, and then they said that as we go forward, they said context matters as well. Context. So what is the context? So uh, does context matter? It does. So for example, you, you know, uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of this guy called uh, Vishnu Gupta or Vishnu Sharma or Chanakya. Have you Chanakya? Have you Chanakya? He wrote a treatise called the Arthashastra, yeah, or 
the, the it was a tome on economics about 2000 years ago plus 2000 years ago and fortunately everybody thought it had been lost till one old copy surfaced in mysore and the guy sort of it was translated to english and now all of us can read it but when you read the uh, you need chanakya after 2000 years can you say that i am actually reading what that man thought the context has changed there is time and space difference yeah so time and space and uh, it's called distanciation distanciation yeah where there is a distance between what happened so for example they after about um, these two guys dropped the atom bomb in japan so very interesting these two pilots they dropped the atom bomb turned their plane around and left the amount of destruction that they had caused did not figure to them they did not think about it too much several years later somebody had asked them but if you can drop the atom bomb again will you drop it they said yes why because time has elapsed see many people don't understand the horrors of war because they don't see war actually on the ground this is some pictures they see it in the movie somebody firing a, a plastic gun or something like that you don't feel the real pain of so when i used to ask when i used to teach mba i used to ask my class how many of you think we should go to war with pakistan all the south indians living in bangalore will say we should go to war the fellows living in punjab and all that stuff kashmir rajasthan they are not interested because they know they are the first guys to get hit or you know missile or whatever yeah they are on the border so it's like that you this distanciation is very important and also your ability not to connect to an event because it happened a long time ago and you are sort of immune to whatever happened so context matters and then we come to the fiedler's contingency theory model um i want you to i know i think arvind must have sent you an email uh if you can just take it please it's called the lpc model all of you on line 2 lpc yeah so open it guys online can you see my screen no i think you can't yeah no sir no sir yeah but have you got no, the sir. lpc yeah, model yes sir yes sir now open it please you can see my screen now right yes sir now open the lpc yes. model and listen to me very carefully this is not about you now think of somebody whom you would never like to work again with okay think of a person in your mind whom you would never like to work with again now keeping that person in mind answer this questionnaire was that person pleasant or unpleasant so that person was you don't like to work with that person but he was generally pleasant be truthful or if the person was unpleasant you mark unpleasant so you have a continuum of scores if he was unpleasant you mark 1 if he was very pleasant you mark 8 and in the middle or neutral you mark some 4 5 and all that stuff. but this is not about you it is i'm not asking whether you are pleasant or unpleasant i am asking whether that person you don't want to work with again keeping that person central you answer this question take what 5 minutes be truthful and honest there's nothing to think this is not some science paper or something guys online did you understand hello yes sir yes sir ha so do this please 
Also, once you get a score, please add it up. Anybody else? Anybody online? You got a score? Yes, sir. Anybody online? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What score? 80. Okay, 80. 26. What else? 26, 74. Okay. 75. 84. 93. So generally, uh, this is called Fiedler's LPC model. I'll go to the theory in a short while. But Fiedler said something very interesting. Fiedler said... Uh, So Fiedler said that if you got a score below 57, 
then you are task oriented and if you have got a score above 64 then you are definitely people oriented so um, of course there is criticism every theory has criticism and um, so you can also read about this as you go along but you know if you have identified yourself as a task oriented person then you might like to start working on your people skills a little bit and if you are highly people oriented then you might like to start working on your task driven skills because that is equally important and unfortunately at the workplace people who can derive results and outcomes and tasks are more valued particularly if your company is going through a difficult time so there are many examples so you have uh, england uh, voted sir winston churchill of course he is no friend of india but sir winston churchill as their greatest prime minister very interestingly he led england through the war as soon as the war was over he was voted out of office because they did not think he was a great peace time prime minister he was very task oriented very strong but he was not great in normal another good example is general george patton who one of the celebrated commanders in the second world war as soon as the war ended they sent him on retirement great war hero great general but not good in peace times so there are two there is a little difference there so i hope all of you have got a you have determined by your own calculations whether you are task or people oriented yeah so uh, you have done what is called as the lpc questioning now um defining the situation so what is the context so uh, whether it is leader member relations what is your relationship with your team what kind of relationship do you have task structure how complex is the is it a very complex job like building a nuclear reactor yeah or building an aircraft or uh, is it as simple as say uh, forming a ladies club yeah how simple huh? okay uh, and uh, or uh, what kind of position power do you have how much of power do you how do you derive power how do you get power how do you derive power correct Yeah, how how but it's all there how you have a implied position one what else your uncle owns the company implied authority or power what else you're really good at some you're really good at some job which nobody else do yeah so you are the key figure in the whole scheme of so i you know many years back when i was still captain one of my friends who was working in one of these it companies told me i am going to interview a person in the leela palace so i said why so he said no this girl say insists that if she has to join my company i have to be interviewed in the leela palace only so i said kis kick her out he said no but i need her for the project so that is for that moment then i'll take care of you there's a fascinating story about a guy called abraham lincoln so you heard of abraham lincoln you know who he is yeah so he was one of the uh, uh, presidents of america so lincoln was an interesting guy lincoln set off the civil war right because of his uh, 13th amendment where he abolished slavery so the south of the country threatened to secede and there was a war between the north of the country the south of the country the american civil war Where several hundreds of thousands of people died. 
the war initially was going badly for lincoln and party and lincoln was a smart guy so there was a general called general mcclellan young person about 30 years old and lincoln wanted the general to lead the union forces that is his armies mcclellan was acting with funny like that girl i want to have interview in leela pass yeah so it is said that the president with his defense secretary that is the minister for war and a couple of other people went to meet mcclellan at his house which was a few couple of miles away from the white house in washington when they went there they were told that the general has gone to watch a play and he will come back late so the president said i will wait so they were waiting the general ally arrives and then he is told that the president of the united states is waiting for him he says tell him to come tomorrow and he goes and to his bed and goes to sleep lincoln goes back the next day to meet him with and his two ministers are furious they say you are the president and this fellow is making you look at the leadership lincoln says for the moment i need this fellow to win the war it's not about my ego it's about finishing the task i need mcclellan so mcclellan led his forces a year later later lincoln sacked him yeah mcclellan went home is forgotten except for people like me who remember the guy for all the wrong reasons yeah but the point is that can you be like that can you keep your ego aside and look at the job at hand what do i need now to do to get this thing accomplished so it's a great so it's your position so he did not use his power as the president of the united states he said that i will reach out to this guy as a people's person get him to lead my armies because i need him now maybe in the future i will see so i don't know what happened to that girl in that company but i was very amused that she wanted to sort of be interviewed at do you get do you get people like this who throw their weight no lot time so you have to look not at yourself but at what your company needs at that particular point of time swallow your ego and then get the job done and then you are a good manager you are a good leader then yeah so um fiedler came up with this model and he called it the fiedler's contingency model what generally fiedler said in short is that if you look at these two pecked lines the solid line and the pecked line so the pecked line is task oriented so fiedler said that task oriented people are very good when the situation is favorable and particularly when the situation is unfavorable okay and he said that when the conditions are moderate you bring in the relationship oriented when things are going fine don't bring in a task oriented person because they are going to mess it up they will make people uncomfortable people will leave and go away and so on and so forth right so when things are going fine or they moderately good have a but otherwise have a task oriented person because you need them to sort of get things activated and get move, moving along so that was the start of the contingency what is contingency theory contingency means use the an appropriate leadership style change your leadership style dependent upon the situation and the follows and then you had several other um so situational leadership theory is a contingency theory very interesting is the like you saw, saw the blake and mountain you have the hershey and blanchard this is also one something you have to remember because for the first time they brought in followers so far we have not been talking about followers. first time hershey and blanchard said your success as a leader depends upon your followers and what style of leadership do you adopt for different kinds of followers so because he said that when um you look at say enthusiastic beginner freshers you have a bunch of freshers you know you have say chaps have just passed out from engineering and they've come some 15 of them what kind of a leadership style would you adopt will you tell them look here chums have lunch 
and then go and do whatever you want to do and lead the team is that how you're going to approach them so you might like to actually get hold of them and say this is how it is to be done and this is how i want you to do it tell me when it is done yeah you don't adopt this style with highly experienced people with highly experienced people you delegate and you tell them that this is the job to be done mate i know you're capable go and but people mix up they try to tell experienced people so all of i find that a lot of people are telling me how to do the simplest things i try to tell them that i commanded ships that were more than 1000 crores yeah you don't have to tell me simple things tell me what should be done and i'll get it done for you no they'll tell you exactly how they want it it generally and then they laugh it annoys people yeah but if you get freshers you must you must guide them and you must be very very clear with them so it's a directive style yeah and then you come to the delegating style where eventually a uh, highly competent and highly committed people are with you you just delegate the job and don't interfere give them autonomy give them freedom then the other style like coaching and the supporting style coaching is of course some competence but low they are not very committed and they have some levels of competence and then uh, the 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 supporting style is high competence but variable commitment so you can again alter your leadership styles as you sort of go through several of these um different types of followers and different types so now we have moved from the trait theory to the behavior theory theory to the contingency theory where we are also looking at the situation and we're looking at the type of follower that we have and then there are different kinds of theories you can read them the path goal theory path goal theory says that so um when people ask me what do i what do you do so i say generally i am the figure head i go for all functions and i am the cheer leader i cheer people he said that's all you do yeah i said one once in a way when there is some obstacle i remove it yeah i sort of get that obstacle out of the way that's all what else are you supposed to do as a leader yeah so the path goal theory says that good leaders are watchful and when their followers are having obstacles they get them out of the way or tell them how to go around it yeah okay so um there are youtube let me see what it is okay we'll come to it then so, and then there are uh, um charismatic what is a charismatic leader somebody who enjoys charisma so for example some states in india you elect polit elect actors as their politicians you know they become chief minister so started off i think with uh, tamil nadu andhra pradesh and so on and so forth charismatic leader these are inti ramarao you dance on the screen and stuff with heroines about one third his age and everybody thinks he's a great good luck to them i mean i really don't know yeah but um or or and then you had people like say mg ramachandran and um, jayalalita all actors larger than life and people sort of look up to them as charismatic people also immolate themselves when they die they commit suicide because they have a huge amount of emotional connect and appeal so um charismatic leaders uh, are kind of vision and articulation personal risk willing to take on high personal risk incur high cost and engage in self sacrifice to achieve their so say people like mgr and all need not have entered politics he had a lot of money he could have gone and bought himself a 10 acre plot in uti or somewhere and but they entered politics at high personal risk personal risk to themselves and they can see people can see it 
and um, sensitivity to followers' needs. They take care of their followers. Free auto rickshaw to you. Free plot of land. Free gas. Free whatever. Yeah. So they who's paying for it is another story. But I am ready to sort of uh, give you sensitivity to followers' needs and unconventional behavior. If you look at people like say Richard Branson, you know Richard Branson, he has Virgin Airlines. He parachutes to meetings. He does weird things, right? Elon Musk is another good example. Um, all these people, uh, Steve Jobs, yeah, well, well, could be very nasty. He could also be very kind, and he great vision and articulation, personal risk. All traits sit very well. Unconventional behavior. Yeah. Gandhi, for example, used to never. I mean, he could. He would write with a pencil till he couldn't hold it anymore. Why should he do that? And get a new pencil, a small pencil till it ran out. He couldn't hold it anymore. He used to write with that. Yeah. So these are people. Or his great experiment with eating uh, only dry fruits. And of course, Gandhi had several other. Uh, you know, weird behavioral patterns. He's a great leader. Let's not take that away from the fact. And he contributed enormously to India's freedom movement. But he also had great weird behavioral traits. Yeah, as did Elon Musk or Steve Jobs or uh, Bill Gates or any of these. You know, I don't know whether you watch this movie called Gandhi. There's a, there's a movie called uh, made by Sir Richard Attenborough uh, several years back. Very interesting scene where he throws his wife out of the house because she refuses to clean the toilet. So Gandhi had this thing that everybody should clean the toilet, public toilets. And his wife says, "I I won't do it." And he says, "Get out of the house. You know, I don't want to." She says, "Where should I go? I don't care. Just get out because you are not sort of." Uh, you don't belong here. So he was not an easy person to deal with. Although we all think Mahatma, and we have elevated him to a position, and so on and so forth. So somebody took great. Um, went to an argument with, with me the other day because I have talked about an exchange between a gentleman called Sir Vishweshwaraya. If you heard about Vishweshwaraya, he was an engineering genius, and uh, uh, he he. Um, Electrified Karnataka, first state in India, or Mysore at that point in time, and he was um, very well educated. He sort of had a run-in with Gandhi because he used to wear a suit and a gold watch, and apparently Gandhi made fun of him. And so he told Gandhi that everybody is like you. That India will be living in its villages even into the twenty-second century. So somebody said, "No, but Gandhi is Gandhi. You cannot criticize him." And he's a great guy, but you can criticize him. Yeah. So uh, that's the point. Anyway, charismatic leaders are charismatic leaders. You have North India. You had uh, actors like uh, Mitha Bachchan got into politics. I think they picked up something from South India. Sunil Dutt and so on. Dharmendra now, Shatrughan Sinha, Hema Malini. All good examples. Or sports people like that Kirti Azad, who keeps jumping from one party to another party. Every now and then, yeah. So these people have charisma. Unfortunately, what is the problem with charismatic people? One. What else? No. Sometimes they start believing in their own unrealistic vision. They are not. They don't have their feet on the ground, and they start believing in their own greatness. Yeah. And they lose touch with the common people of reality. You know, they still think they're in a movie. This is a movie, and I will win eventually. I will face the villain. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen in real life. Yeah, so, charismatic leaders. The problem with charismatic leaders is they can't take criticism easily, and they believe that whatever they're doing is the right thing. So, they can be. If it goes off track, it can be a little. Dangerous. Yeah. So you can have a mixture of everything, as long as you are aware of what you are doing. 
as long as you don't start believing that you are the next best thing to god and you have problems you have issues other people also have problems and issues and you need to take all this along while moving ahead you are fine but the minute you start believing in your own success stories are there is nobody as intelligent as me i am the greatest leader that was born in this earth you start having so for example adolf hitler he was okay he was doing something and then he had success unfortunately he started believing started believing he is the next chengiz khan or alexander the great or julius caesar when that happens and then uh, see hitler and all were very charismatic people the way he spoke he could rouse an entire you know 100000 people by his talk very impressive you hear it you can't understand a thing but you can make out the energy he thumped the table and, you know say several things which may not make sense to people but they are drawn into his sense of and then they come with a vision then they will say that you know the german so hitler first of all very impressive guy is charismatic germany was going through a bad time economic issues he came and said that all our problems are because of the jews all our problems are because of the they own the press they own the banks they interfere they make our country weak and we must yeah and uh, this this whole conflict between um, um, the jews and the christians has been going on because the christians believe that jews executed or crucified you know their messiah so this tension prevails he used it very well he brought an emotion into it nice pot he stirred it with his charisma and you had 6 and 1/2 million people who died yeah so charismatic leaders are all right till they start till they don't start believing in their own sense of greatness that's why you have democracies and you have people who can keep them in check but if you can't keep them in check then you've just about had it so you're right you can get several leadership styles so if you have got charisma please use it but to good measure if you got power use it to do good not to do nasty things no huh? so if you have got the power to fire people should you fire people not necessarily use it very judiciously and selectively the dark side of charismatic leadership and all this i seem to have some videos here let me see what these are just give me a minute hope shall we go for a break otherwise yeah we'll come back in about 50 we'll come back at uh, what's the time now we'll come back at 11:15 ha huh? guys online 11:15 please okay sir okay sir okay sir Yeah, uh, guys. Hi, uh, back. Hope you had yeah. a good coffee break. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to show you an example of uh, cha- charismatic leadership, which I was talking about. And we're talking about the Nuremberg, probably in the 1930s. Uh, yeah. Can you just... In German medieval Nuremberg, the marching, seething squash of Adolf Hitler's Nazi Congress comes to an end. One minute. There's no, no uh, video here. Yeah. Huh? Not able to hear anything here. Hmm. Start from the beginning.
and in German medieval Nuremberg, the marching, seething squash of Adolf Hitler's Nazi comes to an end. This year they say there are 800,000 pairs of boots standing heel to heel, waiting for the Führer's final speech. And the high spot comes when, after a detailed review of Nazi achievements, Hitler cries, my life's fight has not been in vain. Wenn du mehr als 10.000 Euro auf einem Bankkonto hast und okay. nicht willst, dass das Geld bald in Flammen aufgeht. Organization Culture. Right, so I just gave you a glimpse of uh, what a charismatic leader and Hitler was a charismatic leader. And uh, 800,000 people, you couldn't understand, but you could see the energy that he brought to the table. And uh, 800,000 people means about three fourths of the population of Bangalore assembled at one place. Yeah. And no wonder he could sort of get away with killing six and a half million people. Good. So we'll move on to organization culture. Um, and what does it mean? Organization culture, all of you know, have heard about it. People, organizations talk about it. What does it mean, organization culture? Culture is something that is grown out of the years and years of people's behavior and uh, uh, maybe the procedures they follow. So organization culture is the, that thing which the organization is built on. Okay. Very uh, garbled, uh, Vijit. Um, anybody else? All of you have an organization culture or you don't have? So there was a US Supreme Court judge said that most people know what it is but cannot describe it. What is he talking about? No, no, but he was talking about pornography. Yeah. So most people know what it is, but can't describe it. Culture is a little similar. You know, most people know what it is, but it's very difficult to put your finger on what exactly is culture and why is it so important? So that's what we're going to discuss. Why is culture so important? So everybody talks about culture. Infosys says we've got a culture. TCA says we've got a culture. Uh, the Tata say we've got our own culture. Reliance has got an own culture. What is the difference? And that is why people have problems when they move from one organization to another organization. So, because the culture is amorphous, you can't see it really. You can only feel it. And unfortunately, you may not be a good fit to that particular culture when you go there. So that's why it's so important. It's also important. So for example, at least in my time, if somebody went to a service selection board for the National Defense Academy, and you had parents who came from the armed forces, you got a few marks extra. Why? Because they believed that you understood that culture. So for you to sort of step into that culture was now much, much, much easier. And so that's why they talk about culture fit. And again, coming back to Google, you know, once, so Google never selects you for a team or a role. Select for a role because they have to fix your pay band. Once you join, they allow you to room around and then you can go and meet any team you want. And then once you meet that team, they will then you can have lunch or breakfast with them. 
and if you and the team hit it off and you feel you're a good culture fit you can then join that team but all these things should align you must be happy with the team the team must be happy with you and you must be a good culture fit like this you can go around for a year and actually do nothing but find your team that's a fascinating way of working culture is very important for a lot of organizations so we shall discuss or describe the common characteristics of organizational culture compare the functional and dysfunctional effects what are some of the functional effects of culture what are some of the functional effects of culture okay it gives meaning so it 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 gives you a sense it gives you an identity right so india has a culture right does it give you an identity it does so yoga is part of our culture say or um um a family ethos is part of our culture and so on and so forth they make up our they make up our value systems and things like that so um it is a sense making mechanism where you get you feel comfortable you say you feel you belong to something that's why when you go to say america and you are walking down the road even a pakistani becomes your friend why because you share common culture right um you know you don't sort of relate the same way to a polish guy or a swedish guy or a britisher and so on so on. so uh, uh what are some of the dysfunctional effects of culture culture can sometimes become too overbearing and can prevent you from doing certain so it kills innovation in a sense if it becomes very 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 rigid so uh there are some issues with strong cultures as well identify the factors that create and sustain an organization's culture what are the factors that create and sustain an organization's culture show how culture is transmitted to how is culture transmitted to employees how do you come to know of the culture of your organization how yeah and good how the leaders yes so for example many years ago um, apparently uh, when bangalore airport was on the at hl road the old airport and uh, shri ajim azim prem ji landed there so his merc or whatever car he drives i think it's a merc did not go to pick him up because there was some lack of communication so azim prem ji gets into an auto and then reaches his office and then doesn't say anything about it he doesn't tell his driver anything about it or the guy who was supposed to fix that and then he just goes back to work so this is a story what does it tell you about wipro don't complain i mean this is pretty it's okay flexible flexible and just because i have a merc and i am the boss doesn't mean that i'm going to sack somebody for this small mistakes are passe it's acceptable so culture is conveyed through stories yeah um narayan murthy also has several stories like that right um so there's this organization i don't know whether i told you the story but this organization called nordstrom i heard of it nordstrom is an american upmarket store i love to go there because great branded clothes you get and sometimes they give you fantastic discounts so it's my favorite haunt you can spend a day there you can drink coffee and generally browse clothes and you get all brands right from boss to calvin klein to whatever so uh, nordstrom uh, nordstrom um it so happened that there was a family traveling have i told you the story no there was a family traveling and then this family had a burst tire so uh they were going at a high speed and the car swerved and all that and so the family then walks into a nordstrom store the manager is very well dressed and he comes out and the fa father is very angry he says that because of your negligence and you sold us faulty tires i have this you have this problem and you endangered my family so the 
manager is very polite. He says, sir, please sit down. He gets new tires. Tires are replaced. Uh, these people are given something to eat and drink. Then half an hour elapses and he comes and says, your car is fixed. Please go. And uh, thank you for allowing us to be of service. So by this time, this man is, uh, he's kind of quietened down and he says, don't take this personally, but you shouldn't be doing this. You shouldn't be selling defective tires. So, so he's leaving. And then the manager says, sir, thank you for coming here, but we don't sell tires. Yeah. So then this guy is shocked. He says, yes, I didn't buy the tires from you. Uh, but why did this manager do this? And what does the story tell you? So Nordstrom has this philosophy that anybody's customer is my customer. Yeah, and anybody who walks in, we will, we will serve you. So it's a brilliant story about the culture of, yeah. And if ever you go to the US or somewhere, check it out. It's a great store. So you can take out as many clothes as you want and not buy them. Now you can browse to your heart's content and take out clothes, try them, and do whatever you like. So the thing is that culture is reflected through. How do you know about Indian culture? Look at it, the stories. Religious religion being a part, if you look, if you talk about Indian culture, it comes from our ancient stories, maybe which are three, four thousand years old. Yeah. So storytelling, and today it's coming back. The ability to tell stories is very to articulate your point. If you can't tell a story, you're not really going to rise in your career. That much I can promise you. You should be able to tell a good story, first of all. Yeah? Keeping quiet and not saying anything is not good, um, not good for your career anymore. That happened in the good old days. The good boy, silent boy, humble, all that utter nonsense is gone. Today, you have to speak and make your presence felt and make your Point, you must have a brand, personal brand. This guy believes in this and he can defend it. Yeah. So, uh, ethical culture and a positive culture. What is an ethical culture? Yeah. So, how do you create that? So, that is right. We all understand what is ethics, but how do you create an ethical culture is very, very important. So I don't know how many of you read this story uh, called the emperor's new clothes. So uh, the emperor's new clothes is a, a story written by a guy called Charles Christian Andersen from Denmark. It's a kid's fairy tale, but it's classic. So the story goes like this. There's a king who not only is boastful, he's vain and he is pompous and he's arrogant. And he must, he is very fond of new clothes. He wants to wear new clothes every day. And his ministers also understand the king, their boss very well. And this pervades the kingdom. So two people walk in one day and they uh, they are the gate and the gatekeeper stops them. What's your business? State your business. So they say, we are here. We are the finest tailors from the neighboring lands. And we come here to stitch the king new clothes. So the guard runs and tells the minister who runs and tells the prime minister who runs and tells the king. Bring them in. So they come in. And so they say, we can make you the finest clothes. It's going to cost you. The king says, go ahead. What does it cost? So they say, give, me, give us a room. You have to give us this much of gold, silver, silk, finest silk from India, and thread. Six months, you can't come and see. We'll take measurement. And you sort of keep clear of us. After six months, your clothes will be ready but nobody can come and see cash in advance. King says done, not his money, right? So they're given a lot of money. So six months later, they got a lot of cloth, silk, gold, everything. So he comes and says, Is my, are my clothes ready? 
And every now and then he's curious, he's trying to see, he says, treat these people well, keep them well fed, give them a lot of wine and food. And then in six months, they said the clothes are ready. And they tell the king, take off your clothes. So he takes off all his clothes and they put something on him. And they say, the only thing conditioned king is that only intelligent people can see these clothes. If you are stupid, you cannot see these clothes. So the king says, excellent. And then he feels nothing on himself. But then he says, these guys said that only intelligent people can see these clothes. So he keeps quiet. And he asks his ministers, can you see the clothes? How fine they are. So all of them says, yes, your majesty. Clothes are fantastic. Actually, he has got nothing on. So now he says, I have to go on a procession and show my people my new clothes. So he goes out in a procession and they're going. And then everybody says, everybody knows this. Only intelligent people can see his clothes. So everybody says, what great clothes are these? There is only one girl who's seven years old who says, but he has got no clothes on. And then her father slaps her and says, shut up. So your organizations are mostly like that. Yeah? Where you create an atmosphere of fear. And then anybody who is willing to speak the truth, you shut them up. So you must have culture. And then you create unethical organizations because fear pervades the organization. So the emperor's new clothes is a fascinating story of organizational ethics and how organizations actually create an unethical situation. Everybody knows what's an ethic or what ethics are, but they create a situation where unethical people will. So you can see the king set the context by saying that clothes are very important, by being arrogant and boastful, by spreading fear. It went down his ministers. And then went to the common. So everybody fell in line with this culture, except for that little girl who probably was not part of the system. She came from somewhere she did not know, so she spoke up and she got punished for that. Organizations behave in exactly the same manner. Yeah? So um, it's about what is it? What, how do you? You know, create a positive culture which takes care of ethics and then how national culture can affect the way organizational culture is transported to another country. So national culture is again a little different. How is our culture different from America or Russia? Or So when a company, go, in, say Infosys goes and opens an office in Romania, are there problems? Yes, there are. Because we are Indians. We have our own culture. Romanians have their own culture. Right. Uh, what is our problem, say, with people who came in uh, in the 10th century from present day Afghanistan? Present day, they were not Afghans. Yeah. Say, Mohammed of Gore is not an Afghan. He's a Central Asian Turk who occupied, used Afghanistan as a stepping stone and then came into India. The problem was he has a different culture, which is, which is not in alignment with the local. So there is always a tension. Same with the British. They came with a culture which was very alien to existing culture, which happened to be in India at that point in time. So there is tension. Similarly, if you take an organization to another country, how is your culture playing off against that culture? Or for that matter, say you're a person from North India, you come to Bengaluru. Is there a tension in culture? There is. Because uh, people here look at things differently than you might actually. And huh? whatever we look at, sometimes you look at, do you feel a difference? And then the artifacts are very different, like food. The food that one region eats is different from the food that another region eats. And I remember that as a young boy, as a cadet, I had gone to uh, Kerala and I had a room in the YMCA. So I wandered in for dinner and looked around. And so somebody was eating eggs and somebody said, this is uh, beef. I said, okay, where's the vegetarian stuff? Vegetarian? <laughs> so there's no vegetarian. So I got the first shock of my life. This is very alien. Yeah. So
so uh, uh, i had to go and find somewhere else to eat and so on and so forth but food is an artifact and that's why get, people get upset when you say you can eat this you cannot eat that and something else yeah because you are now impinging upon same goes for language language is a very important artifact of culture like we discussed in the last class so um, culture is very important because it gives a sense of belonging and a sense of identity to people right and if you mess around with it then you are actually asking for trouble so there are uh, frameworks so that's why you are sitting in this class so to understand how to give meaning to something that looks amorphous yeah so organization culture refers to a system of shared meaning held by members that distinguishes the organizations from other so you have shared meaning all of you be believe in something and it distinguishes you from another so how does say the school of commerce and management studies differentiate itself say from the school of engineering we have different culture that we teach different courses is right but we also seem to have a different culture or for that matter how is dhyan sagar university different from jain university or ps and so on and so forth. so um, common characteristics of organization culture so you want a framework you can look at so some of the pr primary characteristics that capture the essence of an organization's culture are adaptable how adaptable is your organization quick are you can you adapt quickly narayan murthy says that adaptability is one of the most important things of present day people and organizations yeah adaptability you all understand what it is can you quickly move and fit into a place flexible make to flexible to new things make your uh, look at indians they can go all over the world and succeed many fortune 500 companies are owned by are are, are uh, headed by indians it's it's not that simple it's not easy first gen sundar pichai is a first generation fellow who has gone to usa and then studied there he comes from a very poor family he went and succeeded or for the for that matter um, vinod dham or many of these people sun microsystems um and so on and so forth people who have gone or uh, satya nadella people who have gone to the us and or europe or wherever they have gone and made a including african countries all those gujus who have gone there and made a great success or new, or new zealand or australia or the uk yeah or canada for that matter now so adaptability is something that is very important and individuals who are adaptable are you adaptable as an organization detail orientation are you concerned with the detail so they say that in the early days when japanese was japanese and we were the indians third world country versus first world country today they are more polite and say developing country yeah but uh, the japanese apparently used to walk in and check the bathrooms first because they know indians proclivity to having dirty bathrooms and they would say if you can't maintain your bathroom then don't be in business what can you take care of if you can't even take care of your bathroom so um, attention to detail can you get into the small details of things they are important if you can't take care of small details so my when i used to go for my viva my examiner used to check the back of my shoes the back portion of the shoes everybody polishes the front portion your back portion was not polished you got kicked out and you came back 6 months later or if your tie was not all right or if your suit was not all right of good quality yeah because is they would say if you can't dress properly what kind of a captain are you yeah so attention to detail is very very important and then results outcome orientation are you what is about results or are you like this you know these kids have this rocking horse all day they will sit and lot of energy is expended the horse goes nowhere but yeah so 
a lot of organizations are like that a lot of activity happens a lot of stuff happens boxes are ticked checklists are made people sign but at the end of the day nothing there is no outcome huh? so is it there in your culture that your result and outcome orientation are you people and customer oriented right are you a collaborative team team orientation and then do you have high levels of what is integrity what is honesty i am i am okay uh, uh, i am okay if i don't give a, or take a bribe that's honesty i am concerned whether you would give or take a bribe also that is integrity yeah so you have people in your organization who you can't say that i am an honest guy but my organization is dishonest you shouldn't be there there no they are paying me 2 lakhs a month so it's okay there's a lack of integrity yeah so you being honest in a dishonest system is not not integrity yeah um i hope you can make the difference between that all of us say you know uh, everybody takes dowry but i didn't take but your whole community seems to be taking dowry why does that happen yeah so um you're honest but you, there is no integrity because you are making somebody else pay yeah you are you are causing hardship to somebody else see dowry um as a system um is not very indian see the dowry exists for example uh, bombay passed from the portuguese to the english as dowry when a portuguese queen married an english king she brought bombay as dowry yeah so uh, this is this is a worldwide phenomenon but it probably served a time and space like i said distanciation maybe there was a context it happened it doesn't have to happen today today people ought to you know earn their own living we're all educated people we can go but you make somebody pay you make somebody a pay for whatever little luxury that you might derive from that uh, doubt so this um by and large it's a practice that is frowned upon and if you have doubt honest answer no honestly i don't we don't as a community we don't have that yeah you will get you will get kicked out of your community if you ask yeah you can't go and overtly ask people for you can you run the risk of being ostracized and people will look at you in very poor light yeah some value system still exist so um yeah but anyway it's a practice good luck to people whatever they do yeah so uh, another common cultural framework that is how organizations define themselves are a clan a clan that is we like a tribe yeah uh, uh, there is uh, we have an organization where all people are canadians or all people are tamilian or all people are bengali so they don't believe in this concept called diversity where you people learned in the first class now i don't care about diversity i will have all people from my it's a clan and you have several organizations you have all these lala companies which operate for example even the tatas for a long time they had only people of their people don't talk about it but they will head the organization and be an important clanish yeah? um you have other people like for example asian paints asian paints was started by a few gujaratis in the 1960s or 70s somewhere along in the end of 70s they decided this should be a professional company they stepped out they brought in people from the iims and they said you run this this company professionally for us look at where it is today so clan versus 
a, a professionally run organization are different. Both have their you know, uh, good points and their bad points. And then you have an adocracy, the market, uh, and the hierarchy. Yeah? So what is a clan? It's an extended family. There is a lot of mentoring, nurturing, participation. As long as you are loyal, I'm loyal. So please take care of me. Performance is not the big thing here. Yeah? Loyalty takes more. So don't get into an organization which is clannish and then say, I'm the greatest performer. It's not going to work. Because performance is not something that they're looking for. They're looking for loyalty. How loyal are you? Okay. So that's the, that's the problem. And advocacy is dynamic, entrepreneur-driven, risk-taking, and values innovation. Like, say, for example, like the Googles, and, uh, 3M, and some of those companies, where innovation, risk-taking, um, maybe Apple, dynamic, a lot of energy, a lot of things happening, and so on. It's an adocracy. And uh, then you have a hierarchy, structure, control, coordination, efficiency, stability, Indian Army. Are they innovative? Not necessary. But they want stability. So they have a strong hierarchy. And then you have market that is result-oriented, gets the job done. Now go and get, I don't care if you have to bribe somebody or not, go and get the damn job done. And uh, values, competition, achievement, they get the energy from, they will compete. So if the Tata's open a jewelry store, you will have reliance next to them. We are here to compete. Yeah? And we will compete and we will get the job done. This is a it's good. You walk into a Kanishk store and you walk into a Reliance Jewelry. You will see the stark difference in how they do business and what is their value proposition. What is it that they, they bring to the table? Yeah, you find out and let me know. Yeah. And can you notice a difference in cultures? So again, culture uh, is very, very interesting. And this is how you can define it. You can also, uh, uh, Franz Tropendar was a Dutch guy and he brought in, um, you know, at the international level, he, you can look at Franz Tropendar. Madam, you should get a notebook unless you're like C.V. Raman or something. Write something then. Hmm. So, um, at least note down these names because you won't remember Franz Trompenar was a social scientist and he talked about different cultures, like different aspects of culture, like egalitarian. Egalitarian is what? Egalitarian is everybody is treated equally. You think India is an egalitarian country? Yeah? So you can have, you have egalitarian countries like Australia, New Zealand, yeah? and then slowly kind of comes on the US, UK, and so on and so forth. We are, we are a reasonably hierarchical country. And then you've got task-oriented and you've got person-oriented again. So you've brought different dimensions to how corporate culture functions at an international level. So this is Trump and R. Good. So culture, uh, organization culture is concerned with employees' perception of the characteristics of the culture, not whether they there's nothing about liking or not liking. Indian culture is Indian culture. You don't like it, bad luck to you. This is how it is. Yeah? The, the, so so uh, many foreigners are puzzled. Um, uh, you know, uh, my friend, South African friend used to say, Captain, can I take this cow home? No, you can't. It is part of the Indian culture. It will be on the road and you will leave it alone. Yeah? So uh, uh, that's how it is. I mean, you... There's no, you don't have to explain everything. Is concerned with employees' perception of the characters of the culture, not whether they like them. Does it encourage teamwork? Does your culture encourage teamwork? Does it reward innovation? Does it stifle initiative? So cultures can actually have a problem if very rigid cultures can stifle initiative and 
Suppose you keep blasting people every time they make a mistake. You're going to have a problem. Yeah. So it stifles culture. It differs from job satisfaction. Job satisfaction is evaluative. Organization culture is. Um, so, yeah. So there is a difference between how satisfied you are and what you can be very satisfied in a place which has no culture. Or you can be very dissatisfied in a place which has a great So organizations have a dominant. So, for example, you can you can be a set of Indians working in a company like Microsoft. There is a dominant culture. You can have a subculture, which Indians bring to their own small group. Yeah. So there are organizations which don't allow it as well. So, for example, in the arm for the Navy, you're not supposed to have subcultures and. All the Kanadigas cannot get together and make a busy bath on Sunday morning and eat it or something. Like that. So your, your training is so is hammered through at a young age as an officer that you you don't talk religion, you don't talk politics, you don't talk caste, you don't talk. Um, so caste was something that never figured in any discussion. Say even when I grew up. First time I heard somebody asking me, what caste are you, was in a university. And somebody came and asked me, are you this caste? So I said, what business is it of yours? How should it matter to you? But apparently it mattered to him. These kind of questions don't happen on ships and so on. So discussion doesn't center around this. Yeah? So uh, cultures can be sort of hammered through at a so you value systems or what I'm not saying caste, discussing caste is good or bad. I'm not getting in that territory. I'm saying that it doesn't occur in certain areas. In certain areas, it is more. So the certain organizations will say that I will take only people of this caste. Good for them. Maybe it works for them. Yeah, who are we to judge? So you can have a dominant culture and you can have a subculture. So you can have strong cultures versus weak cultures, strong cultures. Of course, if you have a strong culture, which is good in a sense, it can drive performance because people are more aligned. People know what they have to do because it influences people. You must also understand that culture is a controlling mechanism. So say Infosys, uh, do you think a, a normal Infosian will go and give a bribe to somebody? Why? Because the culture says you have to be ethical. There are other organizations which will say, okay, DK, give. So people are quite happy to. So the culture, in a sense, is a controlling mechanism which tells you what to do and what you can do and what you cannot do. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So. It also has to be driven through. Say, for example, <coughs> there's this American company called Alcoa. I don't use that case study now. Alcoa is Al Aluminium Corporation of America. And it is one of the largest manufacturing organizations. So Alcoa, again, was doing badly. And they brought in a government servant to be their CEO. People were actually the stock prices fell further. Once he became CEO, they said, What I mean, the, first of all, the company is doing badly, and they bought this government fellow. So he was a very smart guy, forget his name. He looked around Alcoa and he identified that they had serious safety issues. So safety was not part of their culture. So he started working upon it. And people were dying because of accidents. So he made, she said, I have a zero tolerance towards accidents. And then he brought down the accident rate. And um, one day he found a few people, nuns, you know, these Christian nuns, they had come to his office and he was very surprised. So he said, why have you come here? So they said, look, you talk about safety. He said, yes. He said, you are useless. You don't know what's happening. He said, why? He said, in Mexico, where your Alcoa plant is there, people are dying and you don't even know about it. So he was very taken aback. And then he asked 
who is heading that Mexico team? And then the, the head of that plant was a very close friend of his. And they carried out an investigation and they found that what these people were saying was true. But this was his close friend. He had him sacked. That is how culture gets. So it's, there is no use in having policies. If you don't act upon it, your ABC policy is useless, as useless as the paper it is written on, unless somebody acts upon. Suppose, so I, uh, you know, I was I was the HR director for a uh, not very far from where she works um, of an IT company, where the senior vice president, who was a supposedly a genius, was a rampant harasser of women. Okay. Now, the point came as to what do we do? We'll sack him. Boss, we don't know. We have to create backup. You know, what will happen to production? If you're like that, then what's the use of having a policy? You have to act upon your policy. And people, no women would want to work in that company because this fellow was like a, um, he would go after anybody. Yeah? So you can't have uh, people working in those kind of uh, systems if you don't act upon your policies. Yeah? So that's how culture gets created. The core values should be reinforced and you have to fire people, fire them. So General Patton, um, you know, he, he slaps a soldier. The most celebrated general in the U US Army, President uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, I think President, maybe President Truman had taken over by the time. He made him apologize. He had to apologize to the soldier to front of, in front of all the other soldiers. I'm sorry I hit you. You have to act upon policies. Otherwise, there's no point in having it. Okay, the function of color, culture, it is a boundary defining role. It has a boundary defining role conveys a sense of identity for members, facilitates a generation of commitment. So I'm committed to a cause. Shant, you have something to say? Okay. Facilitates a generation of commitment, enhances the stability of the social system within the um, organization. That's why people, that's why you go to these uh, Haryana and all these Khap Panchayats. And all they don't let you meddle with their culture because they're afraid you will meddle with their social system. So some reporter in jeans, jeans and all will go and a t-shirt will go and say, why you don't allow your girls to wear? It's none of your business. This is our culture and social structure. You, wear, you do whatever you want to do. Don't come from Delhi or Guru Gram and tell us what we should be doing. So, you have to understand that people are protective about their culture because when you change parts of culture, it changes several other things. Yeah. And uh, enhances the stability of the social system, serves a sense-making and control. Yeah. Very important. Yeah. Otherwise, you can't make sense of anything. There's chaos. So culture also creates a larger climate. Organization climate is shared perception about the organization's work and environment. Team spirit at the organization level. Climate can interact with one another to culture and climates. Climate can interact with one another to produce behavior. So like I said, some organizations, if they have a strong policy of like your ABC, if it is acted upon, people will not give bribes. So it controls. If I have a zero tolerance policy towards harassment, nobody is going to harass other people or bully other people or, and so on and so forth. But if you are laissez-faire and you don't have um, a, a good, good, good control over what is happening, it will sort of encourage behavior that may not be so good. Climate also influences the habits people. So you can actually control people's control people's habit habits. So 
Um, I am very particular that my professors and staff come well dressed. Do I come well dressed? You bet. I don't have a tie today, but generally I'm in very sober clothes, no jeans and so on and so forth, but very formally dressed with a tie. And I expect other people to fall in line. That's our culture. Yeah. So it encourages certain kinds of, but if the boss only comes in boxer shorts and, you know, chappals and so on and so forth, and like happens in some IT companies um, and so on and so forth, then what it will, it will encourage that kind of behavior. So the ethical dimension of culture, organization cultures are not neutral in their ethical orientation, even when they are not openly pursuing ethical goals. Over time, the ethical culture or the shared concept of right and wrong behavior in that workplace develops as part of the organizational climate. So very interesting book. I think I'm not, I showed that class. It's called the No Asshole Rule. Okay, try to get a copy and read it. How to behave yourself in the, and make sure other people are properly behaved in the organization. Yeah? It's written by a guy called Brian, uh, Bill Sutton. He's a professor at Stanford University. It's a nice book about what constitutes decent. Today, most organizations don't tolerate bad behavior. You can't go around intimidating people or scaring them and say your job will go. Yeah. Do they do that in your organization? No. It was. It was, no? Ah. So they will awesome. threaten. No, law is quite prevalent in educational institutions as well. You will have crazy guys who will go around threatening other people, saying that, you know, I will see how you continue. It's nasty, not in the 21st century. And um, <laughs> intrinsically, it's not correct. Okay, I think uh, what do cultures do? Of course, they do several things. I think you can read all of these things. <clears throat> okay, let's look at some of the uh, not so good things about culture. For example, uh, institutionalization. Uh, they can institutionalize certain not so good practices, like pleasing the boss. Whenever the boss comes, clean all the you know benches. Yeah. Or um, um, I'm being recorded. Huh? Keep your so yeah, and also you know um, uh, I had gone to uh, another. Uh, we have a dress code, right? So just the other day, I also took over as dean of the undergrad program. I'd gone there. There was one fellow in chappals. He said, "I did not know you were coming." <laughs> So that means he is very clear. If the boss comes, you will come properly dressed. Otherwise, so you can actually have bad habits institutionalized unless you are careful. Um, barriers to change. It can actually create strong barriers to, and like you know, you have to change. You have to be adaptable. Yeah? Barriers to diversity. Like I said, you can have a clannish mentality. You can have people from your village, community, um, language, and so on and so forth. You don't allow anybody else to come in or join the team, which is actually very stupid because you need to have, there's a very nice article, just remind me, I can send it to you. It's called um, Friendly Fools versus Competent Jerks. So do you want to have friendly, foolish people in your team or you want to have competent people whom you, not, you, you may not like very much? What's your choice? You want to have stupid people who speak your language or you want to have competent people who are maybe from some other part of the world. So these are choices you have to make as a manager, as a culture. But you have strong cultures. They can be a barrier to diversity. And you can have toxicity and dysfunction. Yeah, Dis What is dysfunction? What is dysfunctional behavior? 
you don't fall in line you create your gossip so the lowest form of dysfunctional behavior is gossip correct correct so that is the next high. so uh, uh, the lowest form of dysfunctional behavior is uh, you know uh, two people can join together and then tell other people that you know i saw the boss with the private secretary in the cinema uh, last week that's a very normal form of dysfunctional behavior at the lowest level then it progresses aggressive behavior coming not coming to office coming late to office being physically physically violent is the highest form of selling off sabotaging the company talking ill about the company yeah um, or or portraying your company so there was this us a senior vice president who was one day found walking along the road in women's clothing and so he was sacked so he said this is my private time sunday morning i'm not in office but they said you are senior vice president you are portraying your company our company in bad light yeah and the courts upheld the company's decision in sacking him so you can't sort of um, uh, indulge yourself in toxic and dysfunctional behavior and hope to get away with it it's not acceptable people must also understand that most organizations don't tolerate so i have a rule you can complain about anybody if it is found wrong and frivolous you will pay the penalty in ships also we had it you can complain about the captain please but if it is found untrue and it was found that you just cooked it up to create trouble you will go to for three months to jail so people were careful yeah so you cannot indulge yourself in toxic and dysfunctional behavior barriers to acquisition and mergers yeah so the classic example is when the marriage of the century when um daimler benz and uh, chrysler merged they merged it was called the merger of the century these are two great companies one was a middle class american company which catered to large volumes other one was a luxury car manufacturer mercedes benz they came together they divorced in two years among with a lot of turmoil why because the german culture and the american culture the individual corporate culture of daimler and the middle class culture of chrysler just could not sit with well with each other they had severe problems and they collapsed yeah okay good folk i'm going to end my class there a lot of food for thought any questions any questions any questions from online if you are there no sir no sir think no, about sir. it leadership and yeah, yeah i got the point a leadership and uh, uh, culture think about it go and read it and so on and so forth next class i'll talk about a few more topics and then we are done with your trimester 1 then your exams will arrive and then we go no 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 big no, i don't reappear because i believe that you must people must have deep subject matter expertise yeah and so i don't i i, I can of course teach you strategy and i can teach you entrepreneurship several other things i might turn up in the, very unlikely but there's a possibility that in trimester 4 in a specialization if i have the time but i'm very also busy because i am the dean for executive education dean for the full time mba dean for the undergrad now so a lot of uh, people are surprised i take this class hmm no yeah. why you give that intimidatory uh, <laughs> huh yeah yeah but then uh, just that i have short fuse for uh, uh, nonsense yeah and let's get on with the job kind of and uh, yeah and we were even as a kid uh, we were taught don't complain 
If you can solve the problem, go and solve it. If you can't solve the problem, live with it. But don't keep complaining and crying and cribbing and uh, you know nobody is really interested in listening to you. Yeah, and throwing a tantrum. Uh, lesson science. So culture sets in very quickly when you know what your. So that is actually percolated even to my kid, and he's like that. So whenever he complains, then we wake up. Because in that half complaint he makes, then we know that there is something very serious. And then we try to investigate and find out what's happening. But otherwise, uh, yeah. Any other questions? So we're coming to assignment two. Assignment one is almost done. Assignment two, I hope you guys are on track because after the next class, we kick off with our presentation. So you can, uh, Rajan will open up, uh, Professor Rajan will open up a Google sheet. And we'll have two, this will stretch over say one week or so in the evenings. So you can choose your slot, two, two per, per day. We'll have in the evening, maybe seven to eight or so. Or 6.30 to 7.30, whatever it is, whatever is convenient. Hmm? So choice is yours. Only request is try to see, try to get as many of your, uh, group members on board to come there and present because it raises, and if they're not contributing, then don't include them. Yeah. Okay, guys, see you around then. Online, my friends. Yeah, all right, thank you, thank you, Professor. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you Professor. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.